Hi, this is a very special video. In this video, I have the pleasure of interviewing a great mathematician and an amazing author. What happened was several months ago, I did a book review. And over the course of several months, I came in contact with the author of the book and we communicated and we have set up this wonderful interview. This man is a genius and he is an incredible writer. I mean, so good. And I'm just so happy that he's here today and I think you're gonna love what he has to say. So let's go ahead and get started. So question number one, can you introduce yourself for our audience? I'm Tom Garrity. I'm a mathematician at Williams College. Um, I grew up in New Mexico and West Texas, graduate of high school from a small town in Texas. I was an undergraduate at University of Texas at Austin, graduate at Brown, spent a few years as a postdoc at Rice, and then moved to where I am now, Williams. So I've been to various places visiting on sabbaticals. Um, and I've recently written the second edition of a book of mine, All the Math You Missed But Need to Know for Graduate School. Excellent. Thank you so much. So the second question I have for you today is, why did you decide to study mathematics? You know, people do it for different reasons. What was, what was your reason? Um, as to why I'm a mathematician, I think the question should really be, why isn't everybody? It's the, I mean, to me, it's the ultimate structure of reality. It's what serious people do. Now, that's not exactly what I was thinking when I was younger. Uh, I remember when I was 14 in ninth grade, we had to fill out a form listing every class we were going to take in high school. No one ever looked at that form, as far as I know. But we had to fill it out, and we had to put down what our career goal was. And I wrote down philosopher. Within a month or two, I realized that both sounded and was pretentious. So, and I, and I began to realize that probably what I, what I meant was theoretical physicist. And if you'd asked me throughout high school and even my first year at college, I would have said theoretical physicist. And I've wondered why. It's not like mom or dad were theoretical physicists. It's not like my favorite aunt and uncle was a scientist. I was in the panhandle of Texas. There was no physicist around. But it's what I did. I said, it's somehow I wanted to understand how the world worked, or at least a little glimmer of it. And it was only in college that I realized what I really meant was mathematics. And so in some sense, I've wanted to be a mathematician since I was 14. By the way, most people are not that way whatsoever. <laughs> if you could give advice to you know, a math student, what do you think is the single most important thing that a math major should focus on? Um, I don't think there's a single thing that math majors should focus on. Uh, a lot of the developed mathematics through your entire career is this notion of mathematical maturity. Uh, in high school, the main goal is to become fluent in high school algebra. At the undergraduate level, especially in the first mm, two or three years, is to become fluent at writing proofs, which people just don't do very naturally. Uh, the real reason, though, I in studying mathematics is because it should fill you with joy and incredible high moments when you figure something out, when you have insight. That's not to say there's not painful times, too. Math is really hard. Uh, but I think most things that are worthwhile are hard. It's also wonderful. So my next question is, I see you have a new book out. Can you just tell us about your book? I just finished a new edition of an old book of mine. Uh, it's now called All the Math You Missed, with four new chapters chapter on elementary number theory, algebraic number theory, analytic number theory, and category theory. The first edition was this, almost the same title, All the Mathematics You Missed. Now it's All the Math You Missed. Um, it's designed to help people when they go to grad school in mathematics to sort of get into the game. People take all kinds of courses as undergraduates. Very few people take all the courses that are really needed for graduate school. Um, after the first edition came out, I was talking to an old friend from graduate school, David Dorman, who is now a professor at Middlebury. 
And as we were talking, and suddenly a memory came to me that way back when we were both graduate students at Brown University in the early 1980s, we were, it was around the coffee machine, and we were talking about all the material that professors assumed we just knew from college. And we call it that magic summer after graduation where supposedly all this enlightenment came to you that no one had. People figure it out, but no one had. I'm guessing that the kernel of the idea for this book came from that conversation, a conversation I'd, I'd forgotten about until I was talking to him in the early 2000s. Um, what it is, it tries to describe the subjects that I think people should know. Now, you're not going to learn all of this from just this one book. Of course not. But it's mainly, is what's the point of linear algebra? What's the point of complex analysis? What's the point of category theory? Just so you can kind of see the big picture. And it will help you then figure out what you need to learn so you can keep up the conversations in graduate school. Um, that's the main goal of it. Uh, I was very happy the first edition sold really well. And I think the new four chapters should have been in the first edition, but were not. So I'm kind of happy about it. And I hope people read it and find it so useful. So learning to write proofs, in, in my opinion, is one of, one of the hardest things for math majors. Do you have you know, any advice you can give people who are trying to learn to write proofs? Learning to write proofs is, is not easy. Uh, human beings just don't know how to do proofs. Uh, it's, not, it's not a skill you're born with. I remember when I first got it. Uh, it was one of the great moments of my life. Uh, when I was a first year student at University of Texas, an absolutely wonderful professor, Bruce Polka, was setting up a brand new honors program in mathematics. Uh, and so it was supposedly a calculus course, but I now realize it was a course in real analysis. And our textbook was still one of my favorite books of all time, Michael Spivak's Calculus Book, which in the preface to, I think, the second edition, he even says should have been called Introduction to Real Analysis. And I remember that I was just clueless for the first three, four weeks. I remember the first day, it was a Monday, 17 problems, let's say, were assigned from the chapter one. I had not been the best student in high school, and, but I said, this was college, university. I will be serious. I remember that evening walking across the street from my dorm to the brand new Perry Costanetta Library at University of Texas. It's an old building now, but at the time it was brand new. It had a new library smell. And I sat down at a desk and said, I'm going to work these 17 problems. Three hours later, I dragged myself out of the library, having worked at best three of the problems. And I really believe really wasn't sure I had them right. Um, I, the, the assignment was due that Friday, and I worked all week, and I, I guess I got through it, but it did not feel, I just didn't even know what really was going on. Now, Bruce Polka was a wonderful professor, and he could see the frustration in uh, my, in, well, in our, the students' eyes. Encourage people to talk together, to work together. So the second week, three of us gathered in the Perry Costanetta Library. Uh, me, some guy, and third person, Michael Lacey, who's now a mathematician at Georgia Tech. In terms of the ability to write proofs, in terms of development of mathematical maturity, Michael was far ahead of me. And in our conversations about how to do the arguments, it was pretty clear to me which direction the information was flowing. <laughs> it's not like he was getting insight from me. You know, it was almost at the level he would be working the problems and I'd go, can I go get you a Coke, sir? <laughs> it wasn't quite that bad. Um, again, I got through the second assignment. Uh, um, it, it wasn't like an honor code violation, but it didn't feel good. Third week, Michael didn't bother to show up. I did not blame him. But there's a number of us sitting around. It was just hard. I just couldn't figure it out. I couldn't. And I've been working hard, and I, and I did not want to return to a small town in Texas. Um, but I really wanted to do math. And I remember it was a Thursday night. It was not in the 
Perry Costaneta Library, but in a different library at University of Texas, the undergraduate library. And there was a few of us sitting around and struggling. And my roommate had a lot of David Bowie records, and I'd been listening to them. And I remember on that Thursday night, the song of Rebel Rebel was in my head. Rebel Rebel. And suddenly, out of nowhere, I saw what was going on. It, it, like that. And, and it, 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 the experience was incredible. Suddenly, these problems that I hardly even knew what they were talking about made sense. I'm not saying I could do them, but suddenly I looked and went, huh, well, that's interesting. And before, I was going, what are they asking for? I became mathematically mature, at least as far as proof writing went, that moment. From then on, I certainly make mistakes. I still do. But the mistakes are sort of honest mistakes. I just get something wrong. It's not like I don't know how to express myself. It's not like I don't know how to explain it. I, it's not like I don't know what they're talking about. It was a wonderful night. And thank God it was three days before the first test, four days before the first test. So I did fine on the first test, which was really good positive reinforcement. Um, how can I teach that? Or how can people achieve that? It's hard to say. It happens. When you're teaching a proof theoretic course, I've certainly seen students who are who seem as dumb as dirt, and then overnight are doing a work. They something happens and they get it. It's not like this slow linear progress. They suddenly go, I don't even know what they're talking about. Go, oh, that's interesting. Oh, what if you could ask this? What if you could ask this? Do, 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 do. And it's a wonderful feeling. Um, the best way I know how to, how to do it is kind of like how I did. It. Just keep pounding your head against it, and suddenly there will be that moment of wonderful insight. My next question is, do you have any general advice for math students? I don't know if I have any great advice for uh, a math major. Somehow I think that people at colleges and universities should take courses that are challenging, hard, if they're in the humanities, they should be required to read deep books. Uh, in mathematics, it is hard, but it's also enjoyment in it. And you should major in math if you, in some kind of deep sense, like it, enjoy it. Uh, of course, one has to be a little bit concerned about future career possibilities. It is absolutely not the case that you should major in math only if you want to become a professional mathematician. Most math majors do not become professional mathematicians. Uh, they major in math because they, they just like math. Uh, and then they go and do all kinds of things. I, four math majors from Williams are all, all, do everything. I can imagine, almost every career I can imagine. Some of the careers they go into certainly don't require a math major. But I don't think in the history of the world there's ever been anyone who's been turned down from a job from knowing too much math. So my next question is, what is your research area and why did you choose it? Uh, a lot of people have that question, you know, how do they choose their research area? Why did you choose the one you practice? For the last, oh, a little over 20 years, I've worked in an area called multi-dimensional continued fractions. There's no reason for pe most people to know what that means. Uh, let me explain how I got into it. Way back, uh, I think in the spring of 1994, I had just recently gotten tenure at Williams. And at Williams, there's a tendency, if there's a, a choice in terms of who's going to teach what, is that the younger faculty get the preference. And the older people have to take, a, we call it, a hit for the team. I had tenure, so I was viewed as one of the older people. And the chair of the department came up to me uh, at the time, Cesar Silva, and asked me, we have a visitor coming in. He's scheduled to teach elementary number theory. Um, that's a beginning course in number theory. He says, this guy doesn't know any number theory. Uh, would you be willing to teach him? I didn't know any number theory either. But I understood how it worked. And I said, OK, I'll teach it. So it was spring of the next year. And I was teaching 
elementary number theory. I was just using the book that we'd usually used, a book by Stark, a, a really good book. The first half of it was just standard elementary number theory, which most professional mathematicians kind of know, modular arithmetic, things like that. And the second half, you could do whatever you wanted to. And so, since I really didn't know any number theory, I was just going to follow along the book. And the chapter I had to go through was something called continued fractions. Now, I knew a little bit about continued fractions, but not much. So let me explain what's going on. Um, I've been impressed since, I don't know, fifth or sixth grade that with decimal expansion of how you write a real number is dot three seven three seven five two four that it repeats if and only if it's a rational number, if it's a ratio of integers, um, eventually periodic. I remember thinking that was really cool. Maybe seventh grade. But it was, it was, I thought it was great. Most numbers are not rational, even close to being rational. That's why the decimal expansion of square root of 2, which is not a rational number, is 1.41 kind of junk. Um, I'm not really sure what the billionth term of that number is, or the trillionth term, I have no clue. Uh, it's all determined, but it's just, there's, there's no pattern there. Okay. So I started teaching about continued fractions. Now continued fractions are another way of expressing every possible real number. And instead of doing it as like 3.765, you write it as follows. You write it as like 7 plus 1 over 6 plus 1 over 3 plus 1 over 4 plus 1 over 7. It may be going on forever. Um, and it can be shown that every real number can be written in an almost unique fashion in this way. That if this 1 over 1 over 1 over, 1 over goes off and stops, it's a rational number. But if it goes on forever, it will converge to some real number. I, that, was, that was in the textbook. Okay, I was following. I was, I thought it was kind of interesting. I thought about the decimal expansion was a way of writing any real number as, you know, dot, that, 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 that. And now it's another way of writing real numbers. But here's the fact that just, just, just I thought was really cool. Let's try an example. What would be the number 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 2 and make the 2's go all the way. 1 plus and then it repeats 2's. Certainly looks pleasant. What number is that? It's the square root of 2. That the square root of 2, which is decimal expansion is junk, has a very pretty form. And it's actually the case, proven by Lagrange, I think in 1789, that every number whose continued fraction repeats, is eventually periodic, is some sort of square root. Um, I thought, wow, wow, that's really cool. So he had rational numbers, decimal expansion, periodic. S square root, continued fraction, periodic. What about cube roots? And so I asked a friend, Ed Berger, who was in the Williams Math Department at the time, uh, what's the cubic analog? And he went, I didn't know of him. And so I thought, huh, kind of interesting. So in 1996, 1997, I was working in a very different area of mathematics, an area that mixed differential geometry with algebraic geometry. But I decided for an hour a day, I was on sabbatical, an hour a day, I would think about this problem. I kind of viewed it as recreational. Yeah. And I thought about it, and I thought about it. And by the end of that year, I started drawing these little pictures. I started getting a feeling for it. Eventually, someone, it might have been Ed Berger, said he actually came across it. It's, it's something called multidimensional continued fractions. Uh, and that the problem I had of taking a cubic and finding a way to generalize continued fractions to capture cubics by periodicity was posed by Charles Hermite when he was a young person to his friend Jacoby, that there was a method called Jacoby Perone that did not do the trick but was an attempt at it. I began to look at papers on this stuff. I saw that the many of the diagrams they had been drawing were very similar diagrams I had 
one of the great things in that 96, 97 period, I had come up with my own little method that I thought was good. I realized that a lot of the work of Herman Minkowski in 1900 on geometry numbers was trying to solve this problem. Um, and that's how I got into it. And by, I would say, 2001, 2002 is my primary of research. I like it because it's a natural, by the way, no one knows the answer to the basic question. Um, I like it because it's really a mixture of all kinds of areas of mathematics. I have to use tools from very basic number theory, basic linear algebra, uh, recent papers are on dynamical systems, functional analysis, uh, current paper I'm working on is linking it to combinatorics and partition functions. It's a mixture of all kinds of things, and it's not that hard to explain. And so I find it really exciting and um, certainly plan to spend a number of years still working on it. Thank you. So one of the toughest questions I often get is on career advice because, you know, it's, it's tough to give career advice because different people enjoy doing different things. What career advice do you have for math students? I'm not sure I have any really good career advice. I do believe that mathematics is important, and that's it's one of the areas that serious people work in. I also think it's an incredibly enjoyable thing to do. Um, ideally, in an ideal world, people should study what they like, what gives them joy. Uh, I understand there's a pragmatic concern for careers and jobs. Uh, doing math is not a bad thing if you like it. it never stops in your development of mathematics. It's an ongoing quest, at least for me, to become better at math. I'm not a young person, and I am still learning a lot about math every day. And it's a much richer area than I thought when I was 18, and I liked it when I was 18. And so I certainly think that it is the ultimate description of reality, even though I don't really know what all those words mean, or if any of the words mean, but, but I believe it, and I think it's an important thing, and I'm very happy that I've become a professional mathematician. Thank you so much. I can't emphasize how excited I am to be doing this with you. Before we wrap up, do you have anything else that you want to share with our audience here on YouTube? Yeah, there's one thing, one more thing. Um, among mathematicians, they're frequently split into two different types. Uh, there's the theorem builders and there's the problem solvers. There's people who like the big story, the big picture, and the people who think of math as an endless source of, for them, delightful puzzles. Uh, and I think that's overall true. I think of it more as there's the people who like and try to develop the story of mathematics, and there's the craft of mathematics. To do well in math, you need both. You need to know the story. You need to, and hopefully discover your own stories of how things fit together. But you also have to work on the craft of it. Uh, you just do problems, solve things. One of the problems, I think, in elementary education, let's say high school education, it's overwhelmingly craft. It's overwhelmingly learning how to do, you know, solve the quadratic equation. And the story's not there, and so people get turned off by it. It even shows up a little bit in college. Both are needed, and so try to find both the stories and work on the craft. That's certainly how I consciously think about my own work now. Excellent. You know, thank you so much for being a part of this awesome interview. I am super excited about your new book, and I can't wait to check it out. Uh, just great to have you here. I really do appreciate it. And, you know, words of wisdom. It's, it's great to be, you know, talking to someone who, you know, we're very like-minded. I, I think it's really great. Yeah, thank you very much for letting me do this. Um, I hope you people listening enjoy it. Um, I hope they buy the book. Um, and I, I'm, and I'm particularly thrilled because I'm a, I'm a big fan of your website and have spent time watching them. Uh, I particularly like the way you do not hide the fact that math is hard, but that you clearly love it. And, and that's the correct, I think, attitude to do mathematics. So again, thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. 
That was awesome. And I am going to put a link in the description to Thomas Garrity's book in case you want to check it out. I'm also going to put links in the description to some of his videos. That's right. I searched for his name on YouTube and I found some videos he made and they're really good. So I definitely recommend you check those out. They're super interesting. I really, really liked what he had to say in those videos. Just spot on advice, you know. I hope this video has been helpful. Good luck and take care.